God's design for male and female is a beautiful one. We were created in the image of God to function differently, but we are of equal value in the eyes of our creator. God has given us a clear chain of command in scripture, starting with God the Father. And when we do not honor God's clear chain of command, of anarchy results. Today, we're going to look at creation and how God has given us different roles from the beginning of time. We are called to humility as men and women under authority submitted to our head, which is Christ. Join me today as my guest, Pastor Phil Hopper, and I tackle this conversation in a thoughtful and biblical way. Stick around. I think you're going to be encouraged. What are we learning? They are different in function. When Jesus was here, what would he say? I've come to do the works of the Father who sent me. In the Garden of Gethsemane, even so not my will, but your will be done. See, he is equal to the Father, but he was willing submitting to the will of the Father. See, the Father is the head of the Son. In the very same way, the husband or the man is the head of the wife. We're not talking about inferiority here. We're not talking about equality here. Men and women are equal in the same way God the Father and God the Son are equal. What we're learning, though, is we differ in function. And the blessings of God flows through this chain of command. What Paul is teaching is that if the man is not submitted to his head or the woman is not submitted to her head, the blessings of God stop. Mm. And you show me a man that's not submitted to his head, the Lord Jesus, or a woman that's not submitted to her head or husband, I'll show you a home that's in chaos. Mm. That's an anarchy. See, the blessings of God flow through this chain of command. Now, the whole chapter is about authority. He goes on, and in verse 5, what does he say to the woman? He says this. He says, if you pray and prophesy, be sure you don't do it with your head uncovered. Meaning, he expects you to pray. He expects you to prophesy. But whatever you do, if you do, do it with your head covered, meaning you haven't uncovered your head or you have not rebelled against your head. You're doing it as a woman who is in submission to her head, which is her husband and presumably her pastor. I want you to notice something. Paul doesn't tell them not to. In fact, it's clear he fully expects them to. He simply says, when you do this, don't do it with your head uncovered usurping your head, usurping uh, your authority in your life. He says, do it in a way that you're under their authority. And to pray, we're talking about in a mixed assembly of men and women in the body, uh, in an assembly of the church. Uh, Prophesying, what is that? Prophesying is the verbal declaration of divine revelation. I mean, we're talking about teaching. We're talking about Mm -hmm. preaching. I want you to notice Paul is not saying women do not do it under any conditions. He's simply saying when you do it, do it like this. Do it as a woman that is submitted to her head. Mm. And so you have to take that passage in conjunction with this passage in 1 Timothy. It looks like Paul can't decide which one he wants to know. He, He knows exactly what he's trying to do. These are not competing They are completing, and we can see other examples throughout the New Testament. For example, Acts 18, 26 introduces us to Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, Who's Aquila and Priscilla? Well, I know a modern (laughs) equivalent of Aquila and Priscilla. It's, uh, in my mind, is Jay and Heidi St. John, a modern Aquila and Priscilla. This was a dynamic ministry couple. I mean, they really, really were. And what it says in Acts 18, 26 is they found Apollos... Apollos had zeal for Jesus. He just had a really shallow, superficial understanding of Scripture. Guess what it says in verse 26? It says, um, Priscilla and Aquila expounded to him the way of God more perfectly. Mm. See, implication, it was not just Aquila. Priscilla, his wife, was helping teach theology, New Testament doctrine, to this new convert by the name of Apollos. You have a woman here clearly teaching a male uh, New Testament teaching, theology, doctrine. You have, for example, uh, Acts 21 and verse 9, a man is said to have four virgin daughters who prophesied. Now listen, it doesn't say they had the office of prophet, but it says they prophesied. Again, what is prophecy? To prophesy, uh, we would say today preaching. They were 
verbally declaring God's revelation to men and women. And so you see multiple examples, Heidi, of how this is being done in the early days of the church. Um, and I'm convinced when you let the whole council of the New Testament speak, women can be on all levels of leadership within the church. And I have a woman, Debbie Stiegler, for example, who also spoke for me last year on a Sunday morning. Uh, has this wonderful story of healing in her life, and God put some broken pieces back together again. I mean, she Amen. preached an amazing message, but she happens to be on my executive team. Mm -hmm. She reports directly to me, and check this out. She supervises male pastors on our staff. She oversees them. Now, people ask, well, how can a woman do that? Listen carefully. She's not over them spiritually. She's over them operationally. She's over them organizationally. She's not overseeing them spiritually. She's not a pastor, but she does oversee them operationally. I'm convinced that far too long women have not been allowed, for whatever reason, to exercise all types of leadership gifts and speaking gifts in the church uh, because of either just plain old male chauvinism or just really bad biblical interpretation. I don't know which. Uh, mm -hmm. I just know I want to be biblical in all that we do at Abundant Life, and that's why we don't ordain women to be pastors. Paul is very, very clear that uh, men are to be pastors, the overseers of the church. Uh, he appeals here to creation, not culture, when he sets up that teaching. But in terms of various other uh, areas of leadership and, and uh, speaking and teaching, um, I, I'm very much for empowering women to exercise the God-given gifts God has given them. Let's go. Mm, it's so important. You've said many times, and one of the things I uh, noticed about you the very first time I heard you speak, and this was years ago, you talked about a cut and paste theology. It was the first time I'd heard a pastor sort of frame it in that way, but basically saying you can't cherry pick something. You can't take a verse out, paste it in here and then create your own context because a wrong application, a wrong understanding of that passage is always going to lead to a wrong application. And essentially, that's what you're saying here, right, is that we see uh, this wrong understanding, which has resulted in a wrong application, which unfortunately, in many churches across the United States, and I think even around the world, has resulted in women truly being injured, injured, yeah. for sure injured spiritually. They're discouraged in their walk with the Lord. And yet God calls women to every sphere of influence. And I yeah. love that you're touching on that in such a in such a biblically rooted way. I want to ask another question that comes up occasionally. What about the roles of women uh, in the church versus women at home under the headship of their husband? If a woman is called to be under the headship of a man, is it any man or is it that is that man her husband? Let me give you an example. Years ago. Uh, I was asked to speak at a conference in one of the state organizations. And so I spoke there and we had a you know great turnout. I love speaking for whatever reason, you know, I'm kind of like you in that way. I think, you know, people, a lot of people, right. Number one fear is public speaking. You put Heidi St. John up in front of 10,000 people. Let's go. I love it. Uh, it's something that the Lord does in me and it is a joy. It's a joy to, to walk in that gifting. Well, I'm speaking at this conference and the organizer came up to me afterwards and she said, hey, Heidi, we're looking for a keynote speaker for next year's event. I mean, this was 15, maybe 17 years ago, somewhere in there. I said, oh, let me do it. I would love to. Let me come back. I'd love to be the keynote next year. And she said, oh, yeah, we we don't allow uh, women to exercise authority over men. Now, I found this to be amusing because I had just spoken in a smaller room, which was filled with men and women. But she said, you can't come back and speak in the main auditorium because we don't allow women to be in authority over men. And so I went back to her later on that summer and I was like, listen, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but this is such a wrong application. If you if that's really how you feel, then, A, you're blowing it by letting me speak to men in the first place. If the small room and the big room are the same. Right. But my point is, you know, years and years later, uh, they came back to me and said, hey, we were mixing up church and home. And so I'm curious, I know this happens a lot, and there are a lot of women, if, if the woman doesn't understand the scripture, then she can't defend herself, right? And if the man doesn't understand the scriptures, then we lead to, leads to all sort of relational issues, both inside the church hierarchy and in the home. Yeah. 
Yeah, and what what she really illustrated there is that when you when you apply a legalistic approach to any teaching, any doctrine, it always leads to an illogical application. Yeah. Okay. And so yeah. that's what happens here. Here here's the simple reality. A lot of what we've watched happen in society with the modern feminist movement that has morphed a lot in the last hundred years from the Susan B. Anthony suffrage oh, movement. Oh boy. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's hard women. to believe. Yeah, the feminist movement is hurting women terribly. 100%. Now, yeah. now we can't even define what one is. <laughs> right, you talk, right. You talk about hurting a woman. Right. Now, here's the point. The, the Susan B. Anthony feminism is a far different feminist movement than the one we have today. Okay. Mm. That wants to completely erase the role of men, usurp the role of men, emasculate men. Mm -hmm. uh, and you hear a lot today about the toxic masculinity and this horrible male patriarchy. And, and, and uh, let me just say clearly, strong male leadership is not always toxic male uh, patriarchy, no. right? It, it's needed. Strong yeah, it's, male leadership needed. is needed. It's yeah. desperately needed. You, you, yeah. you can't deal with all the bad men by making all the strong men weak men. That's so right. now there's no strong men to deal with the bad men. That's what's happening here in American society. But having said that, let's be honest, there are a lot of women historically that have been under very abusive male authority. Yes. Uh, very, very narcissistic um, and just abusive male authority. And so consequently, there has been this, this reaction by society, uh, again, an overreaction. And in this case, it's left a lot of godly women wondering, what do I do? Do I have to submit to any man? The answer is no. Not just any man is a woman's head. Not just any man is over you as a woman. I think Paul is very specific. There are two men that you should be willing to submit to, your husband and your pastor, on a spiritual level. All right, but what does that even mean? Let's think about this. Ephesians 5. 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the Savior of the body. So women ought to be subject to their own husbands in everything. All right. Now, does that literally mean everything? Paul is assuming you as a woman are married to a godly husband that's leading you in a godly way. He, he's assuming that you're married to a man who is exercising Christ-like headship, uh, not uh, an abusive uh, type of uh, leadership that isn't leadership at all. And so the answer is no. A woman does not have to submit to just any man. She submits to a godly man that's not leading her into a sinful way, in a sinful lifestyle. She's not following her head over a cliff if that's where he's going. Uh, so it, it doesn't literally even mean a woman has to submit in everything because, mm -hmm. you know, Paul, uh, Peter put it this way, we have to obey God rather than men. Yes. And so if the, the male head in your life is trying to lead you in an ungodly way to do ungodly things, in the end, you submit first and foremost to God. Uh, and if you don't have that godly male leader in your life, um, then you should submit to God, not men. It's Acts 527. I, I wonder, can you speak for just a minute to, I'm so thankful that you're, you're touching on this because I'm telling you, you're setting a lot of people free right now. And I, you and I have talked about this, you know, before as we've hung out, you know, on weekends together with your family that I grew up in a home is very much like that, very dominated by a, a man who was not submitted to Christ. And so when you have that man who's not submitted to Christ and a wife who thinks she has to submit to a man who's actually sinning against her, wow, you know, that just sets you up for all kinds of problems. And it was never the heart of God that women should be treated this way. But I'm curious to know, because I have a, a the, the, I'm allergic to the modern feminine movement. It does not represent me, the feminist movement in any way, shape or form as a follower of Jesus Christ. I happen to be very thankful to be married to a strong, godly man. And godly men are needed, I think, now more than in many, many years in the culture. But I'm wondering if you can describe what headship looks like. What does, what does godly, Christ-like headship speak to the men who are like, what does that even mean? What does it look like to be a man submitted to Christ in relationship with his wife? What does that look like? 
Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, coming found in the fashion of a servant, being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Mm. You, you, have, you have three things there. If you want to exercise headship, like Jesus is our head, he's the head of the church, he's the head of the believer, you have humility, you have servanthood, and you have obedience. And what that means is, look, I'm not exercising my headship as a man when I pull out my man card and say, hey, I'm the man, I'm in charge. <laughs> Everybody has to do what I say. I'm, I'm the I'm head trying of the to imagine, house. Yeah. I'm trying to imagine how that'd go over with Christ. Imagine Kristen Jesus. Right now. Does does Jesus make you obey him, Heidi? No. No. This is the point. He he's Lord. He's King of Kings, but he does not exercise his headship by pulling out a two by four and threatening you with it. Mm. See, headship, that kind of leadership makes you want to follow him, not because you have to, but because Come you on. choose to. And that's the type of headship that every man should aspire to, to lead his home with or, or the church or whatever it is. It's that, it's that you have the character qualities of Christ's likeness that you're not, you know, Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 5, not lording over the flock, but being examples to the flock. See, headship is not lordship. Uh, mm. it, it's not lording over people. Uh, because I have the title and I'm head of this home and it's my way or the highway. That's horrible leadership. And I yes, guarantee it it's not working well. Nope. Uh, you might intimidate somebody into following you. You might, you might bully them into following you, but you're kidding yourself. Uh, and you're a pretender and you're a poser and that's all that you are. And you're revealing your own insecurity. Uh, the reason J. St. John is a godly head for you. I'll tell you why. Because he's not so insecure that he won't empower his own wife to be out front instead of him. Mm. See, that's a mark of his own humility, which qualifies him for spiritual authority. He, he's, he's, he's not worried about his wife exercising her gift in a way that sometimes leads him backstage instead of the front of the stage. And that's the mark yeah. of a of a godly leader, a godly head. Mm, mm. So I would I, say to, uh, to, you know, to any woman, look, th this teaching of male headship is not a doctrine uh, that should be used to coerce you or control you mm. or bully you or make a doormat out of you. Nowhere in the New Testament is that taught. And that is not the application that Paul intends. What do you do if you're married to a man who's not godly? First Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 is for you. He's very, very clear that the way you change a man is not with words. I know a lot of women that long to be married to a godly husband that yeah. beat their husband over and over again in the head with the Bible will not work. Nope. What Peter tells women in that position is to live the word without even maybe speaking the word so that by what he sees will win him to the word. And so what do you do as a woman? It's, um, it's first of all, trying um, to get out of the way for the Holy Spirit to move in your husband's life. And the way you do that is to pray for him. He says, and put on this inner beauty of a meek and quiet spirit. Doesn't mean you don't say anything, but it's how you say it. Uh, if he feels it's berated. It's a posture of the heart, correct? Absolutely, a posture of the heart, once again. If he feels berated, if he feels scolded, he feels uh, like you're belittling him, speaking down to him. He's out. And so yep. Peter's dealing here with the beauty, the inner beauty of the heart that a man sees. He, he's attracted to you for what you'll see outwardly, but it's ultimately what he sees inwardly that will change him over the long haul. And even then, it's not a guarantee because he's a free will agent. But what I do want to make clear is you do not have to be under abusive authority just because you're a godly woman. And there is a male authority figure, and whether it's a pastor, pastors, um, there's such a thing as spiritual abuse, yep. abuse of authority uh, within conservative, theologically driven homes. Historically, it's happened over and over again, where men basically 
emotionally abuse their wives um, and its sinfulness and its wickedness. One of the things I love about Pastor Phil is that he's not afraid to jump into hot topics. And the issue of authority is a hot topic right now. The issue of submission is a hot topic. Absolutely critical that we understand what God says. And as you heard Pastor Phil say yesterday, it's not hard once you study the word of God to come to a conclusion that is life-giving because the Bible breathes life. The Bible says that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Tomorrow, we're going to talk even more about the roles of male and female, particularly as it relates to marriage. We're going to talk about this idea of toxic masculinity and feminism and what it's done to the roles of male and female in the culture today, and then apply God's word for a healthy marriage. I hope you guys will come back tomorrow for more of my conversation with my friend, Pastor Phil Hopper. In the meantime, have a great evening, everybody. Please leave reviews for the show wherever reviews can be left. We really appreciate it. And I'll see you right back here again tomorrow at the intersection of faith and culture.